Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to a brand new news roundup. And today, we're going over some of the old stuff, but also quite a bit of brand new stuff that dropped this weekend. Starting with some Peacemaker stuff, which definitely caught the attention of DC fans because initially it started off a little bit kind of confusing with the way it was worded. And then as things developed, I feel like we're back at square one of what I was originally thinking. So let's dive into that first of all, and there's going to be many other subjects in this video. I think we're going to get to the Batman 2, we're going to get into where could Grant Gustin be in DC or the DCU and other things like that. But right away, James Gunn posted the threads because uh, Jennifer Holland, James Gunn's wife, posted about Peacemaker filming this summer. So we have James Gunn saying the source is kind of iffy, but this is true. John Cena shared this on Howard Stern last week. To answer your follow-up questions, and, and what he says here as well is quite intriguing with the shooting schedule. With regards to Superman Legacy, Peacemaker, and it's like, damn. Yes, we'll be shooting Superman and Peacemaker simultaneously. Yes, I've written all the episodes, as we know, uh, but no, in the interest of getting the show out there, I won't be able to direct them all. Only some. And yes, Wall is still happening, and Jeremy and Crystal are hard at work uh, writing great stuff, but the schedule was impacted by the strikes, so it will come after Peacemaker. So he's basically admitting there, like we originally thought, and to be honest, like as per the Gods and Monsters Chapter 1 announcement video in January 2023, that was the raw lineup, albeit it was still subject to change. But the thing is, of course, things did change. The strikes put uh, a wrench in the works for all kinds of projects out there, and now Waller is no longer coming out before Superman is it's coming out after Superman, after Peacemaker Season 2. But another thing that I wanted to tackle here is what I kind of thought, that Gunn, were, as he wrote all the episodes, but he wouldn't be directing all of them, only some. So I did speculate a little while ago, and even recently when talking about it again, that after all, Gunn in Peacemaker Season 1 hired three directors, I believe, to direct three different episodes. And I speculated, given that Peacemaker might be shooting around the time Superman would be in post-production, Gunn's still going to be very busy obviously even around post-production, but he might be able to direct one or two episodes at most, and I think he would just kind of hire more than three directors, or maybe keep those same three directors around to just handle the remainder of the season. But now, it's, it's, it's being revealed that it's going to shoot simultaneously, so Gunn is going to kind of take a quick plane, I guess, uh, to travel to shoot Peacemaker. It's kind of hard to wrap your head around. This guy is insanely busy. I, I think you guys know that, but I say it all the freaking time now. I mean, I definitely think Gunn is a workaholic. I I've seen some people kind of spread fear about this, being like, oh my god, just concentrate on Superman. You know, Peacemaker can wait. We don't want it rushed. You don't need to rush Peacemaker. I, I don't- do you really- like, I get maybe the apprehension you have. It's just that, do you really think that Gunn would compromise Superman? Do you really think that- he hasn't kind of thought in his head, hey, I can fly over for this period to shoot this, but I'm going to really leave a lot of heavy lifting to these other directors that I'm hiring for Peacemaker Season 2. I am not worried about Peacemaker Season 2 because Gunn has written all of it. Again, three, three unique directors directed three episodes. I'm, I'm betting if you're a Peacemaker fan, you are a fan of those episodes, so I do think accordingly season two will still feel like season one and i don't think again just because gun is gonna divert a little bit of his attention to peacemaker while superman the the literal first dc movie is also filming i i don't think that would put superman the movie if you will in harm's way but i'm just more like in awe of how you would kind of, you know, compartmentalize everything that you kind of need to do with that insane unfathomable you know, incomprehensible schedule <laughs> that you would have to think about. But this is where the story unfolded a bit because Gunn expanded on Peacemaker to some fans out there of DC. This brings in the question of canon of season one and will some aspects of canon, if you will, from the events of Peacemaker Season 1 be kept in the continuity of, you know, the DCU. So initially we have uh, this user saying, interesting, originally you said Waller was Peacemaker Season 1.5. Is this still true and Waller will be some kind of prequel or will now take place after the events of Season 2 of Peacemaker? 
And, you know, as we kind of briefly went over earlier, this is Gunn saying everything in Waller will take place after Peacemaker, whereas beforehand that wasn't the case. It was literally a bridge. Yeah, season 1.5 of Peacemaker, but that's been kind of retrofitted now. We have this user saying, will everything in Peacemaker take place after Superman? And James Gunn says, answering this again to be clear, Peacemaker season two, he's still calling it season two, okay, will take place after the events in Superman, which, okay, fair enough, makes sense. Uh, but then we have this user saying, including season one, uh, and James Gunn says, season one isn't canon, but no. So I was a bit, not concerned, but I was just a bit like, well, I hope, well, maybe I was a bit concerned because I was, I was like, well, again, I don't see why you can't keep Vigilante and, and John Cena's Peacemaker doing all the things they did, going against freaking Judo Master and all of this stuff, the butterflies in season one. To my knowledge, it doesn't really contradict anything. Again, the only thing that does is that bloody Justice League scene, which is easy to just be like, that never happened. Boom. And Gunn already said that the, you know, transition in Peacemaker from the DCEU to the DCU will be acknowledged in some way. And to give more clarity on what I was just rambling about this user says and this is what i was yeah low-key concerned about but peacemaker killed flag and augie still is james gunn i mean peacemaker what a joke should always be a part of him especially that harley and flag senior would have uh would have both a sickly grudge on the douchebag because of flags yeah so he's basically saying you know the whole rick flag death peacemaker what a joke is quite a big part of john cena's peacemaker's history in the suicide squad but as gun said and this is the be all and end all of this conversation i guess many strands will remain consistent yes in so far as peacemaker's story goes so that basically translates to some events will be maintained in the dcu the new dc universe's continuity so peacemaker in the dcu still stabbed rick flag the same way he did and rick flag died saying peacemaker what a joke so that way you can also take some events in peacemaker season one to still be canon as well but season one as a whole as it was literally delivered to you on blu-ray or on max you can't strictly call that all canon do you know what i mean because it isn't basically because season one as it was delivered to you on max or hbo max at the time has the justice league scene in it so as a result, it's technically non-canon. It's like a different timeline, if you will, or like another universe or whatever. Over on Instagram, Gunn said a similar thing to just kind of clarify. So again, and I am going over this quite a bit because I realize that there's not just thousands or hundreds of thousands, there's technically millions of fans out there who might just be like, you know, on the outside part of the fandom, hearing this and be a, being a bit confused. So again, an example is like question. So, you know, I'm so excited about the new DCU, but also confused a bit. Is it considered a partial reboot since we'll have, you know, returning cast members from Peacemaker and the Suicide Squad? And Gunn says everything from Creature Commandos will be considered pure canon to the DCU, but some strands of previous stories will remain consistent. Which, again, I, I don't think if you kind of, this isn't like a new thing in general, like comic book storytelling anyway, even if there's been a reboot, right? It's what I said at the beginning of this video, even with the DCEU being left behind and going into the new DCU, it doesn't mean that Superman landed on Earth a different way. That is technically a, a very obvious one, but an obvious strand that is remaining consistent from the DCEU to the DCU. Now that may sound a, like an absurd example to many people because you might be like, well, if they would never dare change that. That. But the, that's not the point. The point is, you could argue that might not remain consistent going from one universe to another, but it is. So some aspects of canon from the DCEU and previous stories, as Gunn says here, will remain consistent. Another example of a piece of, str or a strand of continuity remaining consistent from the DCEU to the DCU might be, for example, in Waller and how we've heard a rough logline of the show, obviously being centering around Amanda Waller, but also her daughter uh, and her daughter Leota is in Peacemaker. And at the end of Peacemaker, she exposes her mother's uh, you know, operations like Argus and whatnot. And, and, and Wallace just sat there like, my God, what the hell, you know? Um, so that could be, they, the, there could be fallout at the beginning of Waller from that moment 
in Peacemaker that was originally technically created in the DCEU with Peacemaker Season 1. That's all there is to it. That's really all there is to it. So I just hope that the butterfly invasion and stuff like that is kept. And now with regards to it taking place after Superman, this user says, is that important? Meaning events in Superman will have an impact on Peacemaker Season 2. And Gunn says, yes. So... That's fascinating. I really do wonder what that could be. I mean, we can only really imagine. I'm not saying it's going to be hugely impacting as to, you know, whatever goes on in, you know, setting a low-key stage on, on Peacemaker Season 2. But there might be some kind of, you know, Superman... I was going to say Superman Legacy again. But it is going to be a big exposition dump of a movie with, I'm sure, repercussions potentially, especially with a younger-ish Clark. I mean, he's been an active established hero as Gunn said he is established period I think this would truly be the crowning moment in where you know everyone knows who this guy is and maybe that event whatever that public thing is like what we've heard from rumors or whatever could change things um and as a result obviously carry on to be addressed in Peacemaker Season 2 and Waller and God knows what else. Now from this user saying, did the strike also affect other projects? Like be switched with other projects and stuff in the DCU slate and Gunn basically confirmed what he's somewhat said before, yes. I wish I knew what that was. Uh, I mean, maybe, well, we already know that Waller's been shifted around. We know that Peacemaker's been shifted around. But I'm wondering about Lanterns. I, I think Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow, compared to that original YouTube video announcement, uh, is coming a lot sooner than originally planned. We've heard that Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow looks to be filming uh, towards the fall of this year, uh, around about then. So yeah, uh, inevitably changes. Now in some other Superman news here, we have from DC Film News pointing out that Polar X may have revealed the following Superman actors who attended the Svalbard Norway shoot, saying David Corrin Sweat, Maria Gabriela de Faria, Sarah Sampaio, or Pio, I know people keep correcting me about that, I'm sorry, I will learn it, I swear, but essentially this is when uh, DC Film News reported how the Fortress of Solitude was filmed near uh, this coal mine um, and Polar X then posted that on their Instagram and then tagged some of the actors and as a result people were thinking that maybe, maybe these are the people who attended the shoot there and as a result DC Film News also said don't rule out Nicholas Hold. Uh, they followed him but he's turned off tags. Now I don't want to get carried away with this. I do find it a fascinating theory because we've we've spoken about why is Maria Gabriela de Frias, you know, the engineer filming scenes with Superman at the Fortress of Solitude or within the vicinity of the fortress. No matter what in Norway, we know like Maria was there. Like she was rolling around in the snow. Gunn's got a video of her. They were joking about it on Instagram, as well as David rolling around in his swimming trunks, right? But we haven't really spoken about other characters like uh, Eve Teschmarker or Lex Luthor being now. Just because this page was tagging them. I feel like that can just be done because, hey, look, the cast member of cast members of Superman Lexi, let's just tag all of them. But I also do see how people are like, well, maybe they were tagging the people who they know were there uh, for the shoot. Now, my gut is telling me, which is based on nothing but uh, <laughs> my intuition, whatever that is, I, I just feel like they were just tagging the main stars of the movie but I wouldn't rule it out, which has led people to think, well, okay, what if Lex Luthor was there as well as the engineer, as well as Eve Teschmarker? Well, maybe, you know, like maybe they're filming towards the end of the movie. You know, I know people will instantly shut it down, which is kind of what I was somewhat initially doing, being like, you know, I don't think, you know, the, the Fortress of Solitude is quite a sacred location. It's not only the engineer going to be there, but Luther and, you know, I, I don't know about that. But never say never. Who knows what the plot could be doing? That means not only the engineers there, but Teshmaka and, and also Luther. You can't rule it out. But for now, I will say that I think it is just the engineer. I'm still quite insistent with my theory for now that the engineer will be somewhat of the framed antagonist who thinks she's doing the right thing, but ends up by the end of the movie reversing that and becoming the anti-hero that she is in the authority. She's not a villain, but that's why she's there. She could have, you know, uh, pursued Superman there. But mind you, they didn't tag Rachel Brosnahan, you know, and she's Lois Lane and others. So it's definitely something to think about. I wouldn't rule it out. I know I keep saying that, but you can't rule it out. But I, I don't know how I'd feel about that, about Luther going to the, you know, it kind of reminds me of Superman Returns, Luther stealing the crystals from the Fortress of Solitude. But who bloody knows? Maybe, again, they don't find the fortress, but Lex 
in a way that I've speculated about before is using the engineer as a tool for only the engineer to be like, screw you Lex by the end of the movie and go into her more heroic phase. But initially they've been tracking Superman's flight patterns or something like that. They realize that he goes uh, to this location where, you know, we need to follow him and they think that he has like a base of operations there and they may be right, the fortress, but they might not know exactly where the fortress is. So Superman realizes that he's being pursued, doesn't necessarily give away the location of the fortress, but there's some kind of mini confrontation uh, in the Arctic. I, I don't know, though. Now, also a little while ago, with regards to Superman, Gunn was asked about, besides Donna Superman, what were your other inspirations for making your version of Superman? And here he attached so many images, which I, I think is just Gunn basically saying, not all of them, but like, hey, basically a lot of Superman is inspiring Superman. But I think the one that most people are taking out of this is that panel or the panels from Superman, All-Star Superman, where you have Superman preventing this girl from taking her own life. And people really want that portrayed in the movie because if handled well, it could show how there's such a heartwarming... You know, Superman is a hero in all kinds of ways, right? He can stop a, you know, a falling Daily Planet logo, if you will, from crashing down. He can stop a flash flooding. He can stop a bridge from collapsing, but he can save a cat out of a tree. Or he can do something where it's obviously not so physical, but just fly down onto the rooftop and talk somebody out of doing something like that and pulling them out of the darkness that is, you know, affected them to maybe consider even making a choice such as taking their own life. And again, it's important for me to stress if the lines and the dialogue and the way the scene unfolds is done in such a way where it's approached very carefully, it could, as a result, with David Cornswet Superman lead to a very, very powerful scene and where it shows Superman's genuine care and love for humanity not just like in general but down to the bloody individual like he would it would break his heart to see that happen or somebody commit to that decision and he would do anything and everything to try and stop that this is what i mean by adaptations are copy and paste i don't think all-star superman's gonna be copy and pasted you're not gonna have superman die by the end of the freaking first movie obviously not but you might have a scene borrowed like even superman and lois did this in the previous season but just with lois um stopping somebody from taking their own life through talking to them off literally the edge of a building you know superman isn't only a hero but that could be a moment to show heart warmth and just how he's a friend to everyone at the same time and i think gun is gonna go so deep and I think Borderline shows almost too much of that, if, if that's even a thing in this movie, versus just superhero action. I think we will get the awesome superhero action, like, of course, of course. But I think you're going to get a lot of the, and before anyone says, oh, the cheesy stuff, no, I don't think it's going to always be cats out of trees, flying it down, here you go, girl, and stuff like that. But I do think you're going to get the the friend to humanity, the friend to everyone, the, the, and, and why people love this man and feel inspired and feel like they are his friend. Um, in for, with showing moments like this now of course there's loads of other panels here you know he looks as though he'd been crying i would i really feel like that that just kind of reminds me of if you could show the humanity of superman as well like if there's moments where he feels the i mean can you only imagine the pressure of being superman feeling as though you can't really have time off because you feel like you could be out there doing something to save people I feel like that would have a mental effect on you that is just, uh, you know, incomprehensible, to be honest. And if James Gunn could even show, because that's borderline not realistic, you know, if you could actually imagine being that Kryptonian who could do anything and everything, you would almost self-destruct, right? So I feel like showing the the mental strain on a, on a, on a panel like this for David Corrinsweet, where he might even, I'm not saying he should break down, but like have this moment of where he felt like he could have done something more. That would have been, that would be great. Um, Cause again, it just shows all the layers to this, not only Kryptonian, but this human, you know, reconciling with his human upbringing, but also his Kryptonian heritage as per one of the descriptions of Superman. And obviously you have the scene from For All Seasons with uh, Pa Kent, of which I'm hoping Jonathan is alive in this movie. Yes, I'm saying it again. And then there's, you know, lots of other ones, Super Family. And then there's this one here, of which people were digging into, um, you know, because this was a little rumor a little while back with the shirt and jeans and cape combo, because, you know, yes, Superman's active, but it's not an origin story. But people were like, what if his suit could start off something like this? And uh, we have this comment here from this user on Instagram. 
uh, saying that the new 52 jeans and t-shirt outfit is so underrated and Gunn liked that. And people are reading into it being like, oh my God, could he have actually started out like this? And are we going to see that? And then he gets the suit like maybe 30 minutes into the film from the fortress. Yeah, I, I don't think that's the case. We also have this user here saying, please give us the yellow crest on kal cape and please stay away from any connections to Donna Superman's. Thank you. And, and Gunn's just rightfully so like, I can't do both those things at the same time. I mean, that's very true. Now, I will say... I want this, and you know, shout out to DCU updates here saying maybe what the Cape S would look like uh, with uh, this user's design here, rendering of the Superman S. Um, and we've shouted out his intro that you're seeing on screen right here. Amazing work, by the way. But like, yeah, I think. Well, hey, I've said this the whole time. I want the uh, I want the S on the Cape, and I feel like yeah, not like a literal translation of the of the of the suit symbol on his torso there but like a yellow version of it that's a bit more you know hollow there because it's like kind of reversed right that would be amazing i know some of you really don't want that but i i really now we know what the symbol looks like this is like a good rendition of what that would look like on the cape in a believable design you know just with the yellow there that would be incredible so let me know if you like that as well i think it looks I think it looks good. And now as for Grant Gustin, this has been a thing that I think a lot of people ask all the time. You have one user saying, please cast Grant Gustin as one of the heroes in the DCU. Such a great actor, all his talent is going to waste. And as Gunn says here, and I agree, Grant is an incredibly talented guy performing now on Broadway, I believe, and is absolutely not going to waste just because he's not currently in a DC project. But of course, I'd love to work with him at some point. So yeah, like, you know, he would love to work with him at some point. That is quite literally acknowledging in the DCU as God knows what role. Again, this is an eight to 10 year plan. If successful, you will carry on seeing year three, year four, year five, year six, year seven, year eight, year nine, year 10 of this DCU. And he could fit into some role if he wants to. Now, this is one of the few times where I would acknowledge him being a Flash family member. And the thing is, Grant Gustin's 34 years old now, which is kind of crazy. I'm not saying that's old, by the way, but not by any means. But I remember watching The Flash, obviously, like almost a decade ago now, and he would have been 24. But the thing is, I would love him to be someone like Jay Garrick, like a kind of younger or somewhat maybe near to the right age at the time of when he comes into the DCU era of kind of playing the role there. And what I mean by that is, you know, you've had this with John Wesley Shipp having once played Barry Allen, then uh, Jay Garrick. How cool would that be for like also, you know, Grant Gustin to do the exact same thing? All I'm trying to say is, even if they left it five or six years, Grant would be around 40 years old, like 40 years old. To play, you know, Jay Garrick, Flash, at some point in time, it, you know, I really want a prequel. I've said this so many times. If they want to do a JSA thing, that would be cool. And at the same time, of course, it doesn't have to be speedster related. Uh, it could be a whole new role. Now, I would love for you guys to let me know if you would like it to be Jay Garrick, or would you actually be like, no, have him in present day DCU, um, even though you can have Jay Garrick in present day, but I want him to have a completely, completely different role. Now, lastly, guys, for this video, just a brief, Brief conversation on the Batman part two here. So from Bat Source on Twitter saying, Matt Reeves is set to appear on Felicity's retrospective podcast starting March 13th. Perhaps we'll get some crumbs, keyword there being crumbs on the Batman part two. Now, this is like an ongoing coverage on just like the script completion at this point, because we don't, you know, this is March, right? It was originally having this tentative production date of November. It got pushed back to March, according to Production Weekly. It's clearly not shooting this month. I think we can all agree with that. There's not even been announcement of the script being complete, let alone casting being underway. And I know people say just because there is no news, it doesn't mean that they haven't completed the script or they're doing some things behind the scenes with pre-production. I'm not denying that, but I do reckon by now a major trade like Deadline, The Hollywood Reporter, you name it, would have had some scoop on, okay, like we've got wind that maybe, you know, they're doing some things with casting for the Batman part two. That would definitely have been picked up by now, which is why a lot of people, including me at this point, does feel as though, you know, I think we would have heard if the script was, you know, you know, wham, bam, smack down on the table completed. I'm not saying it isn't almost done, if not basically already done by the time I'm making this video. And we will be hearing things really gain momentum in the next few weeks to a month or whatever. But I'm just saying, I do think it is what it appears to be quiet because they they've got a bit of a ways to go. But the reason why this is a conversation is because on 
a podcast with Roger Deakins. Matt Reeves spoke about how he's still writing with his partner, right? Mattson Tomlin. And they were talking about Greg Fraser and pushing the cinematography further in the Batman part two. So I am hoping that this podcast, whenever Matt Reeves would have gone on it, because I assume it would have been recorded in advance. So maybe, I don't know, around about now, a week ago, two weeks ago, who knows that he, if he says, Oh, I've done... The, he might say something like, oh, I've done the script now. We were kind of entering the next stage of, like, you know, getting into pre-production and maybe building some of the new sets that we're going to have for part two. Or he might even say, like, oh, yeah, I I'm still writing right now, but getting close, getting close. Even a tease like that would be like, okay, maybe we were right. He still isn't done. I hope we get a crumb. I really hope we do. Because at this point... The more time that goes by, I've replied to a few people on Twitter about this, you know, with each passing week, it does feel as though that a delay of some kind of on the release date could happen. And I'm not even being like a negative person there. It's just like literally observing it, right? You know, you've still got main phases of pre-production, even if you want to argue that they are sneakily doing things in the background. They're clearly not filming in March this month right now. I doubt they'll be filming next month. You know, we've still got casting to go for the second movie. Granted that you've already cast your Batman, your Selena Carl and Jim Gordon. That needs to be taken into account it really does it does expedite the process but you still need to find new characters right you, you you just do yes they could start filming around about going into the summer but it could be a summerish thing and then with that being said and done like how long's the shoot gonna be is it gonna be three months four months five months you know normally movies don't shoot past like six ish months that's like the i wouldn't say the peak end because it has been known to be longer and don't compare it to the batman part one which was like an 18 month shoot because my god guys that was stopping and starting and breaking and pausing because of covid uh so in the, most movies comic book movies that you know shoot in three to five months so even with that taken into account you would then have less than a year for post-production then to meet the release date now for the first movie you had like a year of post-production but I, I don't need to go through all of this it's just now we're in March. We're going to be in April before you know it in just a few weeks. It is like, well, are you going to release in October 2025? If you've still got arguably a handful of months to go, even in the best case scenario of ramping up to the first shooting day. That's where it's like getting very tight to meet that October release date. Now, I'm hoping, by the way, like even with that being said, that they could still maybe, if, if a delay had to happen on release date, maybe November, like push it back to like the 20-something of November. That's that's quite a bit more time, right? To like squeeze in some editing and everything Matt Reeves will be, you know, hold over his desk for, um, like we've seen in that photo that you're probably seeing on screen right now. He can maybe do it or maybe even make it a Christmassy kind of thing. I don't know, but that's where it gets into strategy and Warner Brothers like eyeing up release dates and whatnot. So it, yeah, you could argue it could be pushed back like the original release date, October 2021, like October 2025 to March of 2022. March of 2026. Let's hope that's not the case. Let's hope we get a crumb. But guys, we need to... I, I, I'm i not one of those... In, like fan, I, I do agree. Let, let It is what it is. Let Matt Reeves cook. He admits he's a slow writer. But at this point, I think we need some kind of... Like, even if he just said, yeah, we've got a ways to go. Like, the script is maybe almost done. But like, yeah, we, it's, it's probably not going to be until like July, August till we start shooting at best. Okay, okay, at least we know now. I, as a fan, I would kind of like to know at this point. Or if we get into April, I will start to be a bit like, like, surely, surely we're going to hear something soon. And let's hope that we do on this podcast. And I need to stress, don't get your hopes up. It could just be a one-liner. Kind of like what he had in that conversation with Roger Deakins. Like, barely anything. But it would give us that extra context. But let me know what you think of that, guys. And everything else we discussed in today's News Roundup video. Uh, I really appreciate you watching it. Let YouTube know that you do as well. Uh, just by simply hitting that like button. It really does help me out. I'm trying to get... Uh, the non-subscribers watching the channel converted over to subscribers because a lot of you who are non-subscribed, um, my analytics tell me you come back and you come back and you keep watching my videos. Um, but maybe you think you're subscribed and if you think you are, double check because you might not be, but you might think you are because YouTube keeps recommending you my videos. So consider subscribing. Um, and yeah, I guess I'll see you guys in the next one. So I'm going to love you and leave you. Thank you again. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day and I'll see you fans of DC in the next video. Goodbye.